With James Webb operating, we're now looking to what space telescopes are coming next. And one of the big observatories that we should all be keeping our eye on is the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. This is like an equivalent telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope, but it has a much wider field of view. And it's really going to help us characterize dark matter, dark energy, search for transits of black holes, all kinds of really cool stuff at the large scale of the universe. But it's also going to be equipped with a really next generation coronagraph that will be able to block the light from the star, be able to observe planets nearby, and sort of give us a much better sense of what kinds of planetary systems there are out there. And so to talk about the coronagraph specifically, I brought a special guest, Vanessa Bailey. She works with NASA JPL has been working with the coronagraph for Nancy Grace Roman and sort of answers all of my extremely technical nerdy questions about this device and sort of coronagraphs in general. So enjoy the interview with Vanessa Bailey. So how long until we finally get to see this spacecraft launch? I feel like we've been waiting a while. So we expect the, the Roman telescope will launch no later than May 2027. We hope our current schedule has us launching a couple months earlier than that, but certainly no later than May 2027. And the instrument that we're building at uh, JPL, the Roman Coronagraph, is going to deliver to be integrated with the telescope in May of 2024. So just about six months from now. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about coronagraphs, but I just want to give people sort of a sense of the overall mission as well. Um, like, I know it is kind of like a, a twin of the Hubble Space Telescope in terms of some of its parts. So, so give us a sense of, of what this mission will sort of look like and, and what it's going to be able to do. Sure, yeah. So the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is in fact named after, uh, quote unquote, the mother of Hubble, Nancy Grace Roman, who was the first uh, head of astrophysics at NASA. It was her vision to bring space telescopes to astronomy. She understood that by taking telescopes above the blurring effects of the atmosphere, you can get these incredibly crisp images in visible light and access wavelengths of light that you can't uh, access so well from the ground, like UV. We know that that ozone absorbs uh, uh, UV, and, and, um, and so there's interesting science that you can do if you send telescopes above the atmosphere. Um, it's kind of fun to be, to be her namesake. So she championed uh, the Hubble Space Telescope over decades of work. Um, it was her vision to, to bring this to fruition. The, the Hubble Space Telescope is a two and a half meter diameter space telescope. I grew up being inspired by those images as a kid as part of what made me want to be an astronomer. Um, and the Roman Space Telescope is going to be similarly sized. Uh, like Hubble, it has about a two and a half meter diameter primary mirror. So it has about the same light collecting area. It'll observe in some similar wavelengths, visible light and near infrared light. Um, but what's very different about the Roman Space Telescope compared to the Hubble is that um, it has two instruments, one of which is the wide field instrument, which has a tremendously large field of view, things that, that would take um, dozens and dozens of individual pointings from the Hubble Space Telescope, Roman will be able to do in one shot. Um, there's a lot of interesting cosmology science to do with dark energy and dark matter that will be done with that wide field instrument on Roman. And then the second instrument on Roman is the coronagraph instrument. Uh, this is what I primarily work on. Um, and it will be able to image very faint planets around nearby stars. Um, Hubble had similar capabilities, but much lower sensitivity by more than a factor of 100. So there's some technology advances on the coronagraph side as well. And so I think about like my experience doing astrophotography and the various telescopes that I've worked with, you know, I've worked with a, a Newtonian with a fairly, you know, a fairly slow telescope with a very small F ratio and you can look, it's like you're looking through a straw at tiny little objects, but then also like really wide field, really fast astrophotography gear where your, you know, your F stop is like four, you know, you're, you're getting 2.4, you know, you're getting a very, very fast telescope and a very wide field of view. So you're working with the same primary mirror as Hubble, essentially. How do you get such a wide field of view with a sort of a similar primary mirror? What, what changes in the optics to give you that, that wider field of view? And I'm assuming a faster telescope. Yeah, so let's see. 
This, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head for, uh, for the F number for Hubble versus Roman. Um, but I know um, within Roman for the wide field of view instrument, a lot of care was um, put into making the, the aberrations around the wide field of view uh, relatively small. So, you know, that, that optical design is, is a bit out of my area of expertise. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's very important for, for the wide field, of ins uh, wide field instrument science is being able to very precisely measure the shapes of galaxies that are observed over that wide field of view because small um, distortions in their shapes due to gravitational lensing by dark matter between those galaxies and us will tell astronomers about the structure of dark matter in the universe. So being able to uh, very precisely characterize the uh, optical distortions in the wide field, of, uh, wide field instrument is really important to achieving that science. And um, you know, you have to you have to remove fewer systematics if you design a lower aberration system in the first place. Uh, but I, you know, I'll, I'll fully admit that that the WFI optical design is is not my specialty. Right, right. And I guess you know, taking advantage of forty years of of technology improvements, being able to put sort of very cutting edge stuff. I mean, you know, there's sort of like the obligatory conversation about Vera Rubin in almost every video that I do, again, the most massive digital camera ever built, insanely fast telescope system that's going to be just producing enormous amounts of data. And I sort of, I sort of class this in, in a sort of a similar realm, this sort of wonderful era of, of, of wide fields of view, gathering enormous amounts of information about about the universe. So let's talk about the chronograph because you know this is your specialty. So I guess you know my audience is very familiar with what a chronograph is and sort of, but but I know there's a lot of flavors. So let's talk about about the chronograph for Nancy Grace Roman. How how is this one going to work? Yeah. So so that's that's the heart of of Roman chronograph. We're a, a technology demonstrator. That's our purpose. Um, big picture. That's because. By the 2040s, NASA wants to be imaging Earth-like planets around nearby sun-like stars to search for life. I mean, we're talking single pixel, very fuzzy images, right? We're not talking continents and clouds, um, but even to be able to detect those Earth-like planets at all, you're trying to find something that's 10 billion, with a B, times fainter than, than its host star, incredibly close, uh, at least in, in terms of angular separation. What Hubble can do with its coronagraph is on the order of a million times fainter, which is phenomenal. Uh, it lets us see uh, young, hot, glowing Jupiters. Uh, they're still emitting plenty of infrared light from the heat of their formation process. Um, but that's nowhere near what we need for those exo-Earths. So Roman coronagraph is going to be an intermediate generation of instrumentation. Uh, we hope we'll, we'll definitely achieve at least uh, 10 million to one detection limits for, for the, a planet that's 10 million times fainter than its star. Our goal is to do better than 100 million to one, closer to a billion to one. Uh, that's not the 10 billion to one that we need uh, for the Earth-like planets, but um, I'll tell you, if, if anybody thinks you can go from a million to one to 10 billion to one in a single generation, uh, I've got a bridge to sell you, <laughs> so you really need Roman in the middle. Um, more specifically, there's a few different components within the Roman chronograph, some of which are common to what's used in Hubble, what's used in Webb, what's used in ground-based. Um, and those are, of course, the, the focal plane mask, the occulting spot. That's, um, as your viewers probably know, exactly what, what you expect. You're trying to find, trying to see a plane or a bird next to the sun. You hold up your hand, you have, you occult the star. Um, but light diffracts around that opaque disk. Um, and in a subsequent pupil plane, uh, you, you need to put, uh, it turns out that the diffraction preferentially places light around the outer edge of that aperture. And so we, we put in a pupil stop um, to further suppress the starlight, but not the planet light. So that's, that's what Hubble does. That's what Webb does. That's what a lot of classical coronagraphs do. Uh, what we add to that uh, within Roman is the addition of deformable mirrors um, because the starlight suppression capabilities of, of that mask and Leo stop assume that you have uh, a very high quality 
wavefront or very perfectly focused light coming in. Uh, but even the best polishing labs in the world can't polish mirrors down to hundreds of picometers flatness. <laughs> and so uh, we, we have these deformable mirrors that have actuators that you can position to 10 picometer accuracy. That's our, that's our commandability um, to be able to counteract the, um, the, the polishing errors and other distortions in the system that can come into play as you're pointing the telescope around the sky and the thermal loads are changing and things are, are bending and flexing very minutely, but, but we, care about, we care about precision at less than a nanometer of optical alignment. And so that's very similar to an adaptive optic system that you would see it on is. a large ground-based telescope. And like the whole point of going to space is that you no longer have to worry about this pesky atmosphere. And yet slight changes in temperature in space means you have to go back to this process of deforming your mirror. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we um, draw a lot on the heritage of ground-based adaptive optics. Ground-based uh, AO is trying to compensate for the very fast blurring effects of the atmosphere. So there you're making corrections a thousand times a second. New systems are aiming for two or three thousand um, frames per second in, in their control loops. Um, whereas, uh, well, and there, you know, you're, you're lucky if you get down to a few nanometers of, of correction uh, because you're, you're just trying to go so fast and keeping up with the atmosphere, which has very large amplitude variations. Um, yeah, in space, it's it's similar technology, but applied at very different scales. So instead of going a thousand times a second, we're making, you know, astigmatism corrections a couple times an hour. And we integrate with our sensor for that, you know, 20 minutes or so uh, to build up enough sensitivity to measure at the 100 picometer level or, or 10 picometer level to be able to make that correction. Um, so the, the types of errors that we're trying to correct is, as you said, are the very slowly varying ones. Um, we, have, we don't have the atmosphere to contend with, but we have ourselves to contend with. Right. Um, and so you've got this like physical dot that you're putting in front of the star inside the telescope. You're, so you're closing off that light from the star. You're then deforming the mirror to make this sort of everything line up as, as nicely as possible. But I know there's other sort of interference that has to be done within the telescope to take this to the, you know, do you do any of that as well? Mm. So yes. So the, the design the design of these masks, um, you can you can start from very classical masks uh, that are just a, a plain, opaque, occulting spot, um, and the associated um, uh, Leo stops. You know, that harkens back to Bernard Leo, who observed the sun's corona using a coronagraph more than a hundred years ago. Um, the the fact that that the um, the pairing of that opaque focal plane mask and pupil plane mask uh, removes a starlight is because of the way that starlight diffracts and self-interferes within the system. Um, so in that sense, it's taking advantage of, of interference. Um, some of the newer um, coronagraph families have more sophisticated occulting spots that also modulate say, the, the phase of the light. So a, a light wave has both an amplitude, how bright it is, and a phase, you know, what, uh, what is the timing of the peaks and troughs of those light waves as they arrive. And by uh, adjusting the phase um, pattern within the focal plane, you can change the interference pattern that, that the light makes for, for further suppression. Um, and within the, the Roman chronograph, we have one kind of, of focal plane mask that does that. Uh, and we have another kind of, of pupil plane mask. Um, we don't pair it with that focal plane mask. It's a whole, it's a second family of coronagraphs called shape pupil chronographs, which are, are really uh, quite beautiful to look at, in fact, um, because we, um, well, you said we might get into Fourier transforms. Can I, can I talk a little bit about yeah, Fourier yeah, transforms? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. cool. Um, so uh, when, when you think about... Um, a classical unobstructed telescope um, and 
the, the image that it produces has a, a circular core and those rings around it. Um, in Fourier space, an unobstructed aperture is a top hat, and the Fourier transform of a top hat is a sink function. So now you take that in two dimensions, it's a two-dimensional top hat and a two-dimensional sink function. That's, that's your classical um, unobstructed PSF. Um, if you want now not to have concentric rings, but to dig out uh, areas around the core of that point spread function, around the, the core of that star, where there aren't rings, where it's very dark, where you might look for a planet, you change the shape of your input aperture. Um, so they, this, is, this is done with numerical optimization, um, but one way to think about it is that light, light really hates sharp edges, and that's what causes ringing. So if I could make a grayscale aperture that was Gaussian um, in, in profile, I would get a Gaussian image out with no ringing at all. Um, of course, that's, that's impossible to print a grayscale aperture, but you can approximate it by um, printing binary structures that are very fine. So if you kind of squint, it looks a little bit grayscale. Um, and, and so the, the team has optimized these so-called shaped pupil masks to uh, carve out regions of very deep starlight suppression in particular areas around the star. Um, you know, one of them, if you look at it, it's almost like kind of a Batman logo. It's, it's cool stuff. And, and the fabrication for those um, is also done at, at JPL with this, this very cool black silicon technology. Uh, it's very important that in the areas that where in the mask design, no light passes through. It's very important that in reality, no light is uh, passing through or no light is reflecting off of this mirror. Um, and so if you can picture, maybe you've seen in, in recording studios, maybe your audience has seen in recording studios, these anechoic chambers or these foam fingers uh, that absorb sound. Um, this is the light equivalent. It's a, it's a microscopic forest of little silicon trees uh, that, that absorb the light as they come in and make some of the blackest surfaces um, that have ever been fabricated. So there, there's a lot of really cool coronagraph tech. No, no. Is this done like at all dynamically, or is this like depending on what you're actually attempting to observe, or is this sort of just the the, the baseline instrument that you can then use to get this really dark surface? Ah, uh, so so some of some of both. We have <clears throat> we have several different families of coronagraph masks that are installed that we choose in the moment depending on what region around the star we're trying to optimize for. Um, and so in that sense, it's dynamic, but otherwise the masks themselves are static surfaces. They're, they're printed and they're done. What is dynamic is the choice of the masks and then the deformable mirrors. Um, and they dynamically adjust to also um, help further improve the contrast in, in regions of interest. Now, we sort of started at the outset of this conversation about how it's such a wide field of view, and yet a chronograph is very much back to the looking through a straw kind of situation where you're trying to look at one object. So do you, are you able to look at multiple objects at the same time, or is it you have to sort of choose? Are we doing wide field stuff, or are we attempting to block the light of the star and, and look at the planets? Yeah, yeah. So it, the, the amazing thing is that with... Uh, uh, an array of back optics, you can turn a wide field telescope into the narrowest field telescope you, you can imagine. Um, our, our field of view for the Roman coronagraph, um, our, our highest performance region of interest is only one and a half arc seconds uh, in radius. And an arc second is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree, which is, you know, a degree is about your pinky at arm's length. So it's, it's uh, you know, rather than the, more than the size of the full moon, we're looking at the thinnest sliver and, and really zooming in. And, and that was accomplished uh, by the optical designers on the telescope side, adding um, as part of the instrument selector, a number of back optics that, that um, change the, the F number of our beam coming into the chronograph instrument and then further within the chronograph instrument, um, you know, we've optimized that for the very narrow field of view. Um, so on the chronograph instrument itself, we're only ever looking down the narrowest of straws. The interesting thing about the way that the Roman telescope works uh, is that the wide field instrument itself is the guider 
for the observatory. So it is always operating and always taking pictures to keep the observatory stably pointed. Um, it uses that wide field of view and the very long lever arm to, to keep that pointing stable. So wide field images will be collected whenever Coronagraph is observing. Uh, we get to choose where to point, so it'll be kind of random deep fields, but they're gonna get um, you know, a couple dozen uh, fields that are 100 hours or more uh, looking at, at parts all over the sky. So there, there may be some interesting kind of surprise science that comes out of that. Well, you kind of think of like what geologists do, where they think about sort of they find a rock, but they also want to take a picture of where they found that rock and see the area around it. And so if you are, for example, looking at a, you know, some planet that you think is orbiting around some star, but that star is part of a cluster, then there's information in the cluster that might help give you clues about the planet itself. Ah, yeah. And, and now we're getting into to the detailed implementation of Roman. Um, the fields of view uh, of the wide field instrument and the coronagraph instrument are not overlapping. They're actually separated, I, I believe, by a couple of degrees on the sky. But yeah, one, it, one could come back afterwards and point the wide field instrument at the region around where the coronagraph instrument observed if they wanted to study, mm. say, that star cluster. Absolutely. So, you know, what does this get us? So, like you mentioned, okay, we're going to try to get into the 10 million to one dimming, maybe a yeah. hundred million to one. Yeah. But, but as you said, that, that 10 billion to one, that's the million million, I think. Is that the number that everyone always says that you need to be a million? million? Uh, it's anyway, 10,000 10, million. 10,000 million. Uh, will, right. Will, will, is the exo earth. Right. Earth yeah. 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 So that's the 10 billion to one. Um, yeah. So what does, like if you are seeing, say, at the low end of your hopes, what kinds of objects could you be perceiving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the low end of our hopes is, is 10 million to one. And the reason why we set the number there at, at 10 million to one was not actually driven by exoplanet science. It was driven by at what level of performance do you have to have deformable mirrors? That, that work at this precision. Um, there's also some, some cool um, CCD technology that maybe we can get into later that, that you need start to need at around this threshold of performance because our purpose is to be a technology demonstrator for that future mission. So our requirement was set based on uh, the threshold of performance where you need to have new technologies. Um, what that means in terms of scientific reach is um, interestingly, because we are a visible light instrument, um, unlike Hubble which or ground-based, which have infrared capabilities, um, or at least longer wavelength capabilities, our minimum required performance is at a, about 575 nanometers, kind of middle of the visible light band. And none of these self-luminous planets that Hubble or Webb can see are bright. In, in the visible light because they're emitting a lot of infrared light, but they're not emitting visible light. They're not as hot as our sun. Uh, they're, they're half the temperature or less. And so you don't really see them in visible light. So in fact, at our minimum threshold of performance, we won't see exoplanets. Um, what we will see are disks. And um, the universe is kind enough to give us disks in a variety of brightnesses. Um, and when I say disks, I'm talking about kind of souped up versions of our Kuiper belt or our asteroid belt. These are the remnants of planet formation, uh, the lingering boulders and rocks and pebbles and dust uh, around stars. And these are interesting to study because the process of planet formation sculpts these disks. Um, the, in, you know, in our own solar system, the, the asteroid belt sits between Mars and Jupiter. Jupiter has cleared out this region around itself. And Similarly, you can infer the presence of planets or how planetary systems might have evolved with time by looking at their disks. Um, there's really cool, within our own solar system structures in our outer Kuiper belt, resonances that provide clues to how the planets migrated over the course of their history, and we can look for analogs, um, even at our, our minimum threshold performance. What we, our, our best predictions at the, mo at, at the moment for our performance are more than an order of magnitude better than that. So our, our current best estimates for performance uh, are at least 100 million to one, if not more. And that's starting 
I mean, it's on the hairy edge. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, right skimming the surface of reflected light Jupiters. So this might mean for the first time ever, we will be able to look at a cold, mature planet like our own Jupiter, Jupiter size in a Jupiter-like orbit, and see light reflecting off its cloud tops. Uh, if we achieve the performance, I think we can. It's, it's going to be close. Um, but, but that has me really excited. And I just want to compare and contrast that to some of the observations that people might already be familiar with. On the disk side, of course, we have all of the observations of protoplanetary disks from, say, ALMA, where mm -hmm. you're seeing all of these cool kind of, you know, ring-like structures around. They have to be young. You know, you don't get that on a, in a, on a more mature system. It's just these things have to be within the first, I don't know, 100 million years or so of its, of its formation. So when you talk about disks, you're thinking of things that are farther down the evolutionary process of the of the system. Yeah, that's right. So, so most of the most of the Alma disk images that that we're familiar with are exactly from these very young systems um, that are still in the process of planet formation. Um, those systems are just just by chance within the universe, a little bit farther away from us, you know, on the cosmic scale of things, they're still very close. Um, on the scales we care about, they're a little bit farther away. It matters because that means their stars appear to be a little bit fainter. Um, and to do this high precision wavefront sensing and deformable mirror control, we need a lot of, comparatively, a lot of photons. Uh, so we're stuck uh, at our highest performance anyway, looking at the brightest stars. So these protoplanetary disks, most of them are not bright enough for us to observe at our highest performance. Um, I think there are perhaps a handful at our goal performance, um, but at this point we're, we're not yet sure. Um, and, but if we, if we can observe those protoplanetary disks, it would be interesting um, and complementary to what Alma does, because Alma and the radio can see through the, the fine dust to the larger kind of millimeter pebbles that all sink down to the, the sort of center midplane of these disks. Whereas in visible light, which is what we would be sensitive to on Roman, we see light from the star scattering off the top surface of, of these dusty disks. We can't see all the way through. Um, and it can be very interesting to compare um, using this multi-wavelength data what's happening inside the disk to what we see on the surface and, and how similar are those observational signatures. Um, so, so that would be very interesting um, to compare if we can achieve it. Um, but the, yeah, the things that I'm more confident that we can achieve, as you said, are, are the older systems. So as you evolve 100 million years, a billion years, the dust and gas within the disks dissipate um, and you're left with um, you know, a, a comparatively low mass thing compared to what you might see in Alma. And with the planets have already formed and now you're, you're using the disk to uh, search for clues to what's happened in the planetary system over the course of its evolution. And then when I think about direct observations of exoplanets, I think about say some of the imaging that's done with say Keck or the very large telescope using the sphere instrument, things that allow you to see actual planets orbiting around other stars, but they are bright stars, big planets orbiting far away from their star. Like everything is perfect for you to be able to make these, these observations. And so how does again, sort of that hundred million to one, what does that get us in terms of, of direct imaging? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's getting to explore a new region, uh, a new type of planets. Um, we, hope, yeah, at that goal performance, uh, at the sort of 300 million to one is where you just start to be able to be sensitive enough to see the old, cold Jupiter-like planets that are in Jupiter-like orbits. Um, this, this, yeah, as you said, contrasts with what we do with Hubble in the ground today, which are young, glowing, self-luminous uh, planets farther from their stars. Um, those are very interesting in their own right. Uh, it's just a different kind of planet. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, we think as well forward on the ground to the next generation of telescopes, like, like the ELT, like GMT, like TMT. Those are also going to have exoplanet imaging instruments. 
that will be complementary again to what Roman can do um, and in, in a really interesting way because, um, you know, being beneath the Earth's atmosphere, it's, it's my opinion <laughs> that, that that's going to limit us to, to never being able to reach the billion to one contrast or, or better um, from the ground. I, you know, there, there's some very smart people who, who disagree with me on that, but, but um, I, it's, it, that's my opinion anyway. Um, but with uh, the very large apertures, um, you know, your, your audience probably knows that the resolution of a telescope is proportional to its aperture size. So if I go now to a 30 meter telescope instead of a, a three meter telescope at the same wavelength, I've got 10 times the, the resolution. Um, and that means I could, in principle, see 10 times closer to the star. And so what this means is that um, although the, the future extremely large telescopes won't achieve the same level of, of contrast, be able to, the, won't be able to see the faintest planets, since they'll be able to look closer to their stars, they'll be able to look at planets that are receiving more light from their star and in reflection appear brighter even for a smaller size. So we think um, that the habitable zones of maybe M dwarfs, maybe something like Proxima Sen might be accessible with a future extremely large telescope on the ground because you don't need that extreme contrast. What you need is extreme resolution. And Roman and this future habitable worlds observatory are going to go after the Earth-like planets and habitable zones around sun-like stars, where you don't need quite as much resolution, but you really need to be able to see faint. And so they'll be nicely complementary. And, like, let's be honest here, often NASA overperforms in what the expectations are. I think about sort of the capabilities of, of Webb. I think about uh, op Spirit and Opportunity crawling around the surface of Mars for over a decade, like in your wildest hopes and dreams, what do you think might be possible with this instrument? Yeah, well, we've, we've already talked about it. That's the goal. That's, the, that's, that's my goal. The 300, so, that's the 300 million yeah. to one? Yeah, 300 million to one. So that gets you the, the Jupiter-like planets. That also gets you another type of, of disk that we haven't talked about so far, uh, which are exozoti. And um, in our own solar system, we have the zodiacal light uh, the, the, that comes from very, a very tenuous field of dust that's kind of captured and co-orbiting in, in Earth's orbit around the sun. It's terrestrial zone dust. Um, in our own system, there's not too much of it, um, but we don't know, um, astronomers don't have a complete census of how dusty a typical system is. And, and this actually matters because if you think forward to that next generation of exo-Earth, you know, Earth twin imager, if they point at a system and it turns out to be so dusty that they can't see the Earth, it doesn't matter whether there's an Earth there or not. All they're going to see is dust. Um, so one thing that Roman might be able to do at our goal performance is survey some of those high priority targets ahead of that exo-Earth imaging mission to see, to confirm, are they, uh, are they probably clean enough that it's worth looking at with, with the next gen. Um, there have been, there has been one ground-based uh, survey from the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer uh, done in the infrared to measure on average how dusty are nearby stars. Uh, and then we can take, we can extrapolate with models from those infrared observations to what we predict invisible light, how light, how bright the dust would be. But I'd feel a lot more comfortable if we could check invisible light ourselves and confirm those models. Um, yeah, and, and you were you were asking uh, earlier, is, is interferometry ever used in the field of exoplanet science? Um, and you know, the answer is yes. You know, that, that's an example within the ground-based community where interferometry in the sense of combining light from, from two separate telescopes is, is used. Um, okay, so like I'm going to ask the question again, um, you know, like I understand, yeah. like I guess, like I understand, like the resol, like what we don't have is necessarily the the angular resolution, right? We don't get, we can't see that Earth just because Roman isn't big enough, and no coronagraph would would do the trick. Mm -hmm. But it's about the faintness of the objects that you're seeing at in that sort of orbital range. You said Jupiter, mm -hmm. could we get to? Neptune. And I think that the thing that's really mm. sort of interesting on in the exoplanetary community 
is the weird planets that they're seeing that are very common around other star systems that we don't seem to have here in the solar system. Like we don't have any mini Neptunes. We don't have any super Earths. If these things are at the right orbit, do you like what, how much harder would it be to be able to start seeing some of those? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not going to be within Roman's reach. Um, as you said, it's a combination of spatial resolution. How close to the star can you see? Um, but even if you plunked a mini Neptune down in Jupiter's orbit, it would be too faint for us to see. So it's uh, planet to star ratio would be, you know, well over the, the 300 million to one. It would be a billion to one. Or, right. or so I'll put that more. down as a maybe. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, that's that, fine. Would, that would be an I wish. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, fine. I wish. Yeah, that'll do. Um, <laughs> but but that but actually that kind of comparative planetology is something that astronomers are really excited about for this next mission. If you can see an Earth in an Earth-like orbit, you can see a mini Neptune. You can see a mini Neptune in an Earth-like orbit or in a more distant orbit. You know, like that habitable worlds observatory is going to do more than just habitable worlds. It's going to help us build out the demographics uh, of, of exoplanets in, through direct imaging. So not Roman, but I'm, I'm excited for the capabilities of the next one. What kind of time is required to do observations to this level of detail per mm -hmm. system? Mm -hmm. ah, so there's there's two components to that. Um, the first is the setup, is uh, aligning the coronagraph masks and then spending hours and hours and hours, you know, a day um, or more integrating on uh, on the target to understand what errors there are in the system that we need to cor need to correct with our deformable mirrors. That iterative process where we expose, correct, expose, correct can can take more than a day when we want to achieve our, our very best starlight suppression. Um, and then after that, let's say I want to take a spectrum of this Jupiter-like planet. I think, again, it's right at the hairy edge of what we think we might do and in wildest dreams, right, is, is one or two systems like this. But there we're talking about 100 hours of integration or 400 hours of integration to get even a, a modest signal to noise. So it's, it's really about demonstrating the fact that we can do this at all. Uh, we're not going to, we're, we're not going to transform uh, exoplanetary science in the way that James Webb has done with its absolutely beautiful high resolution spectroscopy of all kinds of different objects. Um, our purpose is to demonstrate that we can <laughs> suppress starlight and take um, spectra at, you know, 300 million or a billion to one starlight suppression at all. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I think we're, we'll probably be looking at, you know, order of a couple dozen systems over the lifetime of our of our instrument uh, and with deep dive stairs. The, I, I guess I should say um, the, the self-luminous planets that, that Hubble can see and that Webb can see um, at our longer wavelengths, it's not part of our minimum requirement, but we have some longer wavelengths uh, filters installed. Um, if those work as we expect there, I imagine, you know, that's, that's an hour of observations. <laughs> right. uh, th those can be quick. Those are fish in the barrel. Um, so... I mean, we've talked about planets, and obviously this is this is a very exciting field. But but I mean, there are other things where part of the object is bright and part of the object is dimmer, and you want to block the bright part. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about say active galactic nuclei, things mm -hmm. like that. So, are, are there other places where this coronagraph system will come into play? Do you think? Potentially, we need more input from the rest of the scientific community about that be because. Absolutely. This is this is an idea that's been raised. Um, there have been some observations of, of active galactic nuclei or evolved stars uh, that have sloughed off their outer layers with uh, observatories like like Hubble or from ground based observatories as well. Um, one of the the issues uh, that I that I mentioned earlier is that we're stuck looking at the very brightest things in the sky to be able to get enough starlight to do our sensing to to make our our the deepest contrast measurements, the, the most sensitive measurements. And active galactic nuclei and these evolved stars are typically not bright enough for us to do that. What we'll need input about from the community as, as we develop our, our science cases between now and launch, um, I shouldn't say develop, refine them. <laughs> it makes it sound like we haven't started thinking at all. But um, as we refine our science cases is 
a, a more input about a catalog, right? You know, if if um, which which objects would need the highest performance, which ones could still learn something interesting even if we couldn't perform at our maximum. Um, and and so I think yeah, EDN evolve stars um, and potentially. Uh, binary asteroids in in the outer regions of our own solar oh, system, really like say in our Kuiper Belt, yeah. um, are things that people have all raised. But I'll be you know totally honest; they, those science cases haven't been as fleshed out as our primary ones yet. Right, right. And so, as the that that first year of observation run gets gets thought through, some of these science cases could be put into the calendar just to see, is this going to work? Is this the right tool for the job for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, um, one of, in terms of mission planning, um, we're, uh, you know, four years from launch uh, or so. Um, so we have some time to develop our science cases. And then um, as we, uh, well, less than four years from launch, and then in those first few months of, of observing, We'll be pushing the instrument in different ways, and you know, we'll start out with the easy stuff, and then we'll, you know, we'll push a little bit, maybe on a faint star, or we'll we'll push to see on a bright star what's the best performance we can get, and then kind of iterate uh, and and refine our observation plan after that. Now, you know, you've been living and working with this coronagraph, but as you said, this is a this is a technology demonstration for what comes next with the Habitable Worlds Observatory or other facilities. So, you know, what technical improvements have you been, are you excited about or thinking about that you think might be required to get future chronographs mm -hmm. to the next level? Oh man, there's so much. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you know, and, and I, I should say, um, you know, I, I myself am not an optical engineer, but uh, I, I have a lot of smart optical engineers uh, around me. And so I, I, uh, I try to soak up what they tell me with, like a sponge. Um, you know, the, there's a few things. The deformable mirror technology has to improve. I mentioned that on Roman chronograph, we can position our deformable mirror actuators to less than 10 picometers precision, which sounds incredible, but what you need for that future one is one picometer, two picometers. Um, Femtometers? The, yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think what comes it, next. I don't even know what, what the oh. smallest... Yeah. yeah, femtometers is next, right? Yeah. And, and, um, and there's a lot of active development going on because we think that it's not a fundamental limit of the actuators themselves. It's all about the electronics that drive them. Uh, electronics, in digital electronics, you have a certain number of bits of precision. Um, and do you have enough bits in your electronics to, to command um, you know, both a full range on the order of a micron all the way down to a picometer? Uh, and so there are new electronics in development that have been recently demonstrated with, yeah, femtometer, you know, hundreds of femtometers under a picometer uh, of controllability. Um, deform so yeah, deformable mirrors, both in terms of controllability and the number of actuators that they have. Um, on the Roman, we uh, have about 40 actuators across the, the diameter. Um, we think uh, for the Habitable Worlds Observatory, we need at least 64, maybe 96. Um, the more actuators you have, um, the farther from the star... Um, in you can you can dig your dark hole. You can suppress the starlight um, in units of of lambda over d. So this this is where it gets um, maybe back to our, our Fourier transforms. <laughs> um, when um, you know I, I mentioned that that the the p, the point spread function, the image is the Fourier transform of of your aperture, and the width of the core of that image, um, the the width of it is inversely proportional. So the resolution of your telescope is inversely proportional to your to your act to to your aperture size, um, and the so that becomes kind of a fundamental unit of width in an image, a fundamental size scale in an image, um, and uh, if you have um, as as in the Roman case, um, forty eight actuators, um, you can do. 22 fundamental resolution units away from your star um, because of Nyquist um, sampling and signal processing. Um, 
And so if you want to see farther from your star as your resolution increases, it would mean your straw gets narrower and narrower and narrower of your, the, at least the straw of, of highest starlight suppression. So you need more and more and more actuators to bump that back out so you can see solar system scales again. Um, yeah, maybe this was not the best thing to try to explain without a whiteboard. But. Well, no, no, but like I think of the of of the actuators as the resolution of the of the mirror. That that the more actuators you have, the more you can fine tune the shape of the mirror for the you know, the target as well as just the conditions that you're in. And so if you had ten thousand actuators on that mirror, you would have a much better control over the image that you're looking at. And then that sort of be- up and down that that's where you're back to your picometers that you're you know, how how far can you deform it back and back and forth whatever is the and I'm sure at a certain point there's like there's no point to you don't need to go beyond a certain point like the if you can fine tune it it's that resolution and so you know are there technologies that get you you know instead of it being a physical like are there shape memory metals and electronic ways that you can control the shape of this secondary mirror mm-hmm. without it being to the to that degree that you need but but have it be mm-hmm. you know 10,000 as opposed to 48 yeah yeah um right so it's it's a combination of both of those things um and you know we i will i will say that yeah that the types of technologies that that we might need to use um there are a few different ones in consideration. There are um, ones that are voice coils, not unlike those in in, in just your, your computer speaker, um, uh, magnets and uh, and and electronic actuators. There, um, there are ones like in in the Roman telescope that ex- the the physical material itself expands or contracts in the presence of of um, electric fields or, or well in the in response to voltage, I should say. Um, there are, yeah, some some lower maturity but interesting, um, you know, magnetically deformed uh, kind of memory metals that I've seen proposed. Um, there are also ones that that are used on the ground now, um, haven't been used much in, in space yet, um, that are printed uh, using some of the same technologies as you use to to print circuit boards, um, and, and you can print them at very fine scales. Um, and, and uh, a higher number of actuators without making your mirror too large. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of cool mirror development uh, that, that's going on, you know, not just at JPL, but worldwide. Um, other things that are really going to matter are optimizing those coronagraph masks themselves. Uh, we, it's, it's very hard to, to make a coronagraph mask that both deeply, deeply suppresses starlight and can be a little bit robust to small, like focus and astigmatism errors. Um, if you have a little bit of defocus, it causes light to bleed around uh, that, that coronagraph mask right in the location where you're trying to look for your Earth, so right next to your star. Um, so there's going to be a lot of uh, mask development and optimization and coming up with innovative new ways to design those little starlight suppressing masks so that so that we can push as close as possible to the to their stars and, and see as many of the habitable zones as possible. I mean, those are those are just a few. There's a lot of different technologies on on the telescope side too. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then of course there's this possibility of flying a separate spacecraft, the Starshade that could go with the habitable worlds observatory so you put half your chronograph out in space thousands of kilometers away yeah it so at the moment nasa has has directed uh that that we focus on developing an internal chronograph mask first um but it is also is definitely true that there have been previous efforts that have shown yeah the, the there's some promise as well um, it, with the starshade technology. It's an interesting idea that um, you can avoid, in principle, having to place quite such tight constraints on the optics of your telescope and, and instrument itself if you suppress the starlight before it reaches the instrument. There are other technical challenges that go along with that, um, which I imagine you know, weighed into to, to NASA's Direction to us for now to to not pursue that as as the nominal plan, but um, but it's been some really interesting research. 
One of the other technologies that I'm pretty fascinated by is this idea of nulling that if you do build an interferometer and you have multiple telescopes, then another technique kind of comes online for being able to to block the light from the star. So I mean, let's say we hypothetically attach two Nancy Grace Romans to each other with a, you know, 100 meter uh, truss you know, have you thought about or looked into sort of what, what does nulling get us? Yeah, there have been, um, you know, honestly, before my time at, at JPL, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, a relatively recent transplant, so I can't take credit for it. But there were studies done of, of exactly this kind of technique um, for a terrestrial planet finding mission. Um, at the time, it was decided, it, so they, these would be formation flying telescopes, not, I believe, not physically attached to each other, um, but, but with precision formation flying. At the time, it, it was decided that they, the technology just wasn't quite there in, in the way that it was um, for the internal coronagraphs. Um, but this is getting a bit of a new life uh, over in Europe. The European Space Agency has been working through another concept maturity um, exercise on on an interferometry formation flying interferometry mission. Um, their time horizon is is still quite long. It's not something that would fly anywhere near in time to to Roman. Um, I'm not sure about whether they have it proposed to fly at the same time as NASA's habitable worlds or later. Um, but yeah, that, that's something that that ESA has been been trying to reinvigorate a bit as of late. So a question I always like to ask my guests is what they're obsessed about and you know, this sort of gives me a sense of sort of like what's coming in the future. So, you know, what are you thinking a lot about right now beyond like, come on, let's get this telescope into space. But, but what sort of is, is, yeah. What is sort of, what are you thinking about a lot? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head right now. It's let's get this instrument delivered because it's due in May. Um, but, but beyond that, it's, it's a very exciting time to be, in exoplanet imaging because NASA's decided to prioritize development of this exo-Earth imaging habitable worlds observatory as its next big flagship. I mean, that is something that I think a lot of us in the field have been working toward for a good chunk of our careers and hoping would happen. It's So it's, it's really exciting because we're at, you know, not... Not exactly the, the, the blank slate uh, phase because there were a lot of, there's, there's a, a huge body of work that was done in the pre-decadal concept studies and, and people have been doing in, in, in the lab to, to bring us with initial ideas of what that mission might look like. But now, now we have to make it real. So we have, have more realistic budget constraints and more realistic understanding of what telescopes can and can't do than than what we had a few years ago in those those development studies and and now we got to make it work <laughs> so it's those those picometer mirrors it's uh, how do you make optical coatings that are uniform enough to, to be able to correct it's how do you like all of these technology challenges have to come together to make the highest performing telescope that anybody's ever built and and so it, it's a, it's kind of a fun time to be involved in in the ground up and thinking about that uh, I think a, a lot of folks in the exoplanet imaging community are going to be engaged in the coming years yeah there's there's a bunch of big meetings coming up and have, have been had but are, are coming up this fall and it, it does feel a bit like like NASA just blew the horn and said okay let's call everybody together and let's seriously talk about this with web rolling with, mm -hmm. you know, with Nancy Chris Roman now just, you know, g getting assembled and getting ready to go. Now it's time to, to blue sky again and with everything we've learned. And, and I, you know, I, I kind of obsess about the same thing, which is, you know, it was great to talk about Louvoir and Habex and, and origins and all these big next generation space telescope, but you know, those were dreams they couldn't last, but now practic a practical telescope mm. that should give us that Earth-sized world orbiting a sun-like star within the habitable zone is now being blueprinted, and yeah. and hopefully within our life lifetime, um, we will see that picture of that other Earth yeah. or that one yeah, pixel. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that one, pale blue dot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one <laughs> pixel and a and a uh, you know spectroscopy of its cloud tops, but more yep. could we hope for.
<laughs> well said. Uh, yeah. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you and good luck in achieving your uh, 300 million to one uh, sort of contrast between star and planet. And I can't wait to see the first exo Jupiter, uh, I guess, spectroscopy data. Yeah, me neither. It has been, uh, it's such an exciting time for me. And I, I'm, I feel so privileged to be able to be on the science team uh, that, that, and surrounded by such, like, honestly, I have to give a shout out like to this incredible design and engineering teams at, at JPL and Goddard and all of our partners. Like they, I, I really appreciate how they don't just look at the requirement and say, yeah, we're required to do this. Like they have consistently pushed the envelope so that I'll still have exciting science to talk about. And, and that just really makes me excited. Wonderful. All right. Good luck. Thank you for, <laughs> yeah. very much. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and to talk about Roman. All right, I'm going to talk about this topic some more, give you my th concluding thoughts, but also give you some resources that you can follow on this journey. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Just Paul Davis, Vlad Shibelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonad, Maud So, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. For the last couple of years, we've been talking about these next generation mega telescopes, Louvoir, HabX, Origins, Lynx, as well as the big ground based observatories. And we knew this couldn't last. We knew that not all four of these giant observatories were going to get built. And so with the latest decadal survey, astronomers came together and decided, okay, we're going to build the Habitable Worlds Observatory. It's going to be a James Webb class telescope but it's going to have this really powerful coronagraph that it's going to allow it to observe Earth-sized worlds orbiting around sun-like stars in the habitable zone. And this is the plan. And so now we're seeing this telescope start to come together. But it's all going to rely on the coronagraph. The coronagraph is everything. Can you block the light from the star to reveal the planets around it? And there are a lot of technical challenges, both in terms of the optics of the telescope itself, as well as the capabilities of this coronagraph instrument. And so it's quite exciting to see like a space based precursor is going and it never really occurred to me that that Nancy Grace Roman is going to be this technology demonstration of a next generation coronagraph until this conversation. And so now it's sort of changing the way I think about about one of the objectives of of Nancy Grace. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Now I've done a couple of interviews that sort of relate to this and I think you would find pretty interesting. One is a conversation that I had with Dr. Lucy Lebouillou, and she's focusing on next generation coronagraphs. And so, she, well, the kinds of technologies that we talked about briefly in this interview with Vanessa, she's sort of thinking about what comes next. And the other interview that I really think that you should watch is the one that I had with Lee Feinberg. He is sort of the head of the optics behind James Webb Space Telescope, worked on the Hubble Space Telescope, is thinking about next generation space telescopes and the kinds of future technology, quantum telescopes. We have just one of the most mind blowing conversations about the future of space telescopes. And I think you'll find that really fascinating. All right. Thank you, as always, for watching these interviews, listening, and I will see you next time.